Director of Gonzaga University's Faith and Medicine Institute and Associate Professor of Philosophy. Uh, before we begin this evening's program, I'm pleased to announce that, the, uh, that during the first full week of April, the Institute will sponsor two lectures by Father Robert Spitzer, former president of Gonzaga University. And Father Spitzer's lectures will be in connection with his newly published book, New Proofs for the Existence of God, Contributions of Contemporary Physics and Philosophy, about which those who've been around Gonzaga for very long have been hearing for about 10 years. Uh, and I, I spoke with uh, somebody at dinner who said uh, when he was at Seattle U before coming here, uh, there, were, there was talk of this book as well. So it's been around for a while. But finally, in print. So uh, please uh, be on the lookout for announcements of the details as we draw closer to that visit. And I invite you to attend those talks. This evening, however, we are very pleased to present the second of two public lectures by Dr. Edward Fazer on the topic, The Last Superstition, Refuting the New Atheism. And I welcome you on behalf of the Faith and Reason Institute and its executive board. In his lecture last evening, Dr. Fazer laid, laid the philosophical and historical groundwork for tonight's talk. In that lecture, I took it that he made three key points. First, <coughs> that it's important to have a proper understanding of the Aristotelian and Thomistic understanding of, Toma, of teleology or final cause. Second, that the modern philosophical understanding of cause, which is not Aristotelian or Thomistic, has given rise to the problem of causality, in which events are loose and separate such that cause and effect <coughs> are not necessarily connected to each other. Third, in actual scientific practice, researchers have continued to employ a notion of cause that is virtually Aristotelian. The bottom line of these three points is twofold. First, there is no good philosophical or scientific reason to dismiss teleology or final causation. And second, one can make sense of actual scientific practice and of its causal accounts of natural phenomena only by understanding that efficient causation is intimately connected with final causation. In short, Dr. Fazer made the case for the intelligibility of efficient causation only insofar as it involves teleology. Now this was the philosophical heavy lifting that Dr. Fazer did last night. And for those wishing a more extensive account of these matters, I would recommend his book, The Last Superstition, copy, a few copies of which are still available. Uh, and you can pick them up after the lecture at a discounted cost of $15. As I noted last night, Dr. Edward Fazer is Associate Professor of Philosophy at Pasadena City College in Pasadena, California. His doctorate in philosophy was earned at the University of California in Santa Barbara, and he also earned a master's degree in religion at the Claremont Graduate School. He is the author or editor of six books and of numerous book reviews, encyclopedia articles, and scholarly <coughs> and popular essays on a wide range of topics. And we also learned last night that in the midst of all this scholarly activity, he and his wife are expecting their sixth child. Tonight, Dr. Fazer will build on the foundation he laid last night and will speak to us on the topic from philosophy of nature to natural theology. Please join me again in welcoming to Gonzaga, Dr. Edward Fazer. Thanks, Ed. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, and thank all of you for uh, coming, for coming back, actually, after last night's snooze fest. I know it was... Um, <laughs> I know it was abstract and dry, but you all came out anyway for the second night where uh, the payoff hopefully will, uh, will be here for you. Uh, we get a little more concrete uh, tonight in talking about God's existence, having laid the metaphysical background that Brian referred to uh, a moment ago. And I trust everyone's got a, I, I did prepare a handout for tonight's talk, which, um, great, if, yeah, if anyone doesn't have one, you can raise your hand and they'll pass one to you. Brian, I told you, a martini needs an olive. The <laughs> <laughs> I forgot something. See, I gotta match the new atheists at every point. With Hitchens, you know, I... <laughs> 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 okay. 
<laughs> that was below the belt. Um, all right, let's get started then. Um, tonight's talk, uh, last night's talk, I called uh, from philosophy, from natural science to philosophy of nature. And the argument there, in a nutshell, that Brian said a little bit more about it than, um, than I will right now to recap, but the argument in a nutshell, uh, and the argument as summarized in the title, was that properly to understand natural science or the very possibility of natural science, uh, we need to think in terms of the idea of teleology, Aristotle's final cause, that there are purposes built into the natural order, <coughs> built into material substances. So that was a general, I was making a set of general points about the nature of material reality. And the, the relevance for our topic tonight is that uh, laying that metaphysical foundation is essential to understanding how we get from the world in turn to God. Hence tonight's talk is called From Philosophy of Nature to Natural Theology. Now anyone who studies philosophy in a contemporary university is bound to come away with a conviction that proving the existence of God is frightfully difficult at best and probably impossible. This is the reverse of what most philosophers have thought historically. It is also, in my view anyway, the reverse of the truth. In fact, it is not all that difficult to prove that God exists, or at least it is not all that difficult to prove that God exists given certain common sense assumptions about the way the world works, especially certain common sense assumptions about the nature of cause and effect. The greatest of the ancient medieval philosophers, uh, and even some of the early modern ones, uh, thinkers like Plato, Aristotle, Al-Ghazali, Maimonides, Thomas Aquinas, Leibniz, to name just a few, certainly took this view. Why then do so many contemporary philosophers, and indeed so many academics and, and intellectuals in general, mistakenly believe that God's existence is difficult or even impossible to prove? That is a complicated issue, but the answer has much to do with the abandonment of Aristotle's philosophy of nature, and in particular, uh, final causes, an abandonment which, as I argued last night, was a serious mistake. What I want to talk about uh, tonight is how we can, in fact, know there is a God, given a broadly Aristotelian understanding of nature, of the natural world, of material reality. Aquinas summarizes what he takes to be the most important arguments that philosophers have given for God's existence in the famous five ways from the Summa Theologiae, Aquinas' famous five ways. Uh, my own view is that each of the five ways is cogent and when properly understood can be seen to be immune from the standard objections. The trouble is that apart from those scholars who specialize in the study of medieval philosophy, very few contemporary writers on the atheism versus theism debate really do properly understand the arguments. Uh, this is, in, uh, this is part of the reason that arguments for the existence of God seem harder to defend than they really are. It's not that the arguments themselves aren't powerful, it's that any defender of the arguments has to clear away an enormous amount of intellectual rubbish if he's going to ensure that the arguments get a fair hearing. A fair hearing that is to say not merely or even primarily from the complete novice, but also and even especially from the so-called educated reader who thinks he already knows what the arguments say, but in fact knows nothing of the kind. That's why you've got to work through almost 100 pages of philosophy in my book, The Last Superstition, fairly abstract uh, matters of metaphysics, and a long chapter uh, on metaphysics in my book, Aquinas, before getting to any of the actual arguments for God's existence. Certain distinctively modern philosophical mistakes, especially mistakes about the nature of cause and effect, must be cleared up first. Certain extremely common caricatures of the arguments have to be exposed lest the typical reader deeply misunderstand them for the, from the very first line. For example, <clears throat> it's commonly thought that when Aquinas argues for a first cause of the world, what he says is something like this. This is a stock understanding, misunderstanding really, of Aquinas. Quote, everything has a cause, so the universe has a cause, namely God. That's the way people often understand the first cause argument. The standard atheist retort to this argument is, of course, to ask, well, if everything has a cause, then what caused God? And if you say God has no cause, then maybe the universe didn't either. There, we've, you know, finished off Aquinas. The atheist chuckles disdainfully and pats himself on the back for exposing Aquinas as incapable of spotting the most blatant of fallacies. The trouble is that Aquinas never gave this silly argument in the first place. He never says everything has a cause. Uh, indeed, none of the best known defenders of the first cause argument for the existence of God, not Plato, not Aristotle, not Al-Ghazali, not Maimonides, not Aquinas, not Duns Scotus, not Leibniz, not Samuel Clark, not Reginald Garagou Lagrange, not Mortimer Adler, not William Lane Craig, not Richard Swinburne, you can go on with this list, not one of them ever gave this silly ar argument. None of them uh, ever claimed everything has a cause, quote unquote. 
Not one of them ever committed so obvious a fallacy in arguing for God's existence if they committed any fallacies at all. And yet you will find atheist after atheist characterizing this obviously fallacious argument as the basic argument for the first cause, as if everything uh, else that any of these major philosophers had to say about the first cause argument were just a pathetic attempt to patch up an obviously weak case. As I show in my book, this is just one of the many urban legends that pop atheists like Dawkins, Dennett, Harris, and Hitchens rely on to give <coughs> their position whatever rhetorical power that it has. And the word rhetorical here is, is key. Um, the fact that there's been this urban legend, uh, I don't know how old it is, it'd be interesting, you could probably write a book on just tracing the history of this urban legend that the, the cosmological argument is everything has a cause, the universe has a cause. Um, the, the idea that that's the basic argument, you find that in textbook after textbook. And even when writers on the subject go on to discuss more sophisticated versions of the argument, they're often presented as if they were just attempts to kind of patch up the holes in this basic, uh, this basic obviously fallacious bad argument. And that does a lot of the rhetorical work, that sort of move in uh, atheist polemics, in, in the writings of the new atheists in particular. Because it makes it sound like the, like the theist, the, argu the, the defender of God's existence, right out of the gate gives you an argument that's so stupid that uh, a child could refute it. And everything else he has to say then just sounds like he's trying to prop up desperately this, uh, this creaky structure, right? It's pure rhetoric, because no one ever gave this argument, but it's often presented either as the argument or at least as the, the basic idea of a first cause argument. And none of that's true. None of, these are, none of these writers ever gave an argument like that. Certainly Aquinas doesn't. Now here's another uh, common misunderstanding of um, Aquinas' arguments. It is usually assumed that when Aquinas argues for a first cause, what he means is that if we trace the history of the universe backward in time, we'll eventually reach a beginning point, something like the Big Bang, as we would describe it today. And then, so to suppose, his claim is that God must have been the cause of the Big Bang. But that is not what Aquinas says. In fact, Aquinas explicitly denies that we can show through philosophical or scientific arguments that the universe had a beginning. While he did, in fact, personally believe that it had a beginning, on the basis of biblical revelation. Uh, he doesn't think that that's the sort of claim that one should rely on in arguing for God's existence. He doesn't take that approach. In fact, Aquinas thought that the existence of God as a first cause of the world can be proved conclusively even if we assume, for the sake of argument, that the world had no beginning. He's not even getting into that issue for the purposes of arguing for the existence of God. The Big Bang Theory is not the only modern scientific idea commonly but falsely assumed to be crucially relevant to the question of God's existence. Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection is also generally thought to have leveled an awfully damaging blow to belief in God, especially in the work of people like Richard Dawkins. You see this a bit in Hitchens as well. It's, you'd think that, uh, that uh, Darwinism, you know, by, all by itself, single-handedly, Darwin with one hand tied behind his back, you know, destroyed any possible basis for believing in God. And, and Dawkins is the kind of writer who thinks Darwin, you know, solved every problem. Darwinism cures wooden legs, you know, cures, cures, cures every problem. Um, and he certainly thinks somehow that it, that it uh, destroys any uh, possibility of ever being a theist. But the question of Darwinism is, in fact, totally irrelevant to any of the five ways. Um, the prospects for demonstrating God's existence se might seem even dimmer <clears throat> if we extend the evolutionary idea beyond biology and account for the origin of our universe in terms of its having branched off from some other universe as part perhaps of some series of branching universes that extends forever backward in time and across an indefinitely large number of sub-universes within a larger multiverse. This is the multiverse concept. In fact, however, uh, neither Darwin's theory, as I, uh, as I already uh, said, nor the latest speculations of theoretical physicists cast the slightest doubt on the classical proofs for God's existence. That neither of those ideas is at all relevant one way or the other to uh, certainly Aquinas' arguments for God. The point is not that those theories are false. I'm not saying Darwinism's wrong or that the multiverse concept is wrong. I'm not getting, you don't have to get into that issue, one, those issues one way or the other. The point is that whether they are true or false, uh, in other words, is completely irrelevant to arguments like Aquinas' five ways. The reason is that Aquinas is not giving empirical scientific arguments, but rather philosophical or metaphysical ones. That emphatically does not mean that he's not giving rational arguments. It means that not all rational arguments are empirical scientific ones. Mathematics is certainly rational. Many philosophers have taken it to be the paradigm of rational thinking, the gold standard of rationality, but it's not a branch of empirical science. Metaphysics, too, is perfectly rational, even though it is not a branch of empirical science either. 
And what metaphysics is concerned with is not this or that feature of the natural world, but rather with the preconditions of there being a natural world for empirical science to study in the first place. Metaphysics begins with what empirical science takes for granted and thus answers questions that empirical science itself cannot possibly answer. For example, physics, chemistry, biology, and the like all presuppose that there is a natural world, that the things that make up this world undergo changes of various kinds, that they exhibit patterns of cause and effect, and so forth. But how is it possible for there to be a natural world in the first place? How is change possible? How are cause and effect relations possible? Natural science can't possibly answer these questions precisely because its very methods presuppose the existence of the things being asked about. But traditional metaphysics does answer them. And what it says is that the only possible way to answer these questions, the only possible way to explain how there can be a natural world or change or cause and effect is to appeal to a first uncaused cause who has the attributes definitive of God as traditionally conceived. What it says is not merely that the world must have been created by such a first cause at some point in the past, but rather that the world couldn't possibly exist here and now, and that change couldn't possibly be occurring here and now, and that causes couldn't possibly be producing their effects here and now unless there were a first uncaused cause who is here and now, and at any moment at which we might be asking these questions, uh, is keeping the world in existence, keeping change going, keeping causes operative. Now, why exactly? Well, let's uh, turn at last then to the traditional proofs of God's existence. Given time constraints, time constraints I'm going to focus on just one of them, the one that Aquinas uh, regarded as the most evident argument for the existence of God. It's generally known as the argument from motion, was first sketched out by Plato, developed in detail by Aristotle in the physics and the metaphysics, refined by various medieval philosophers and summarized by Aquinas in, as the first of his five ways. And of course, Aquinas discusses it elsewhere as well. Now by motion, Aquinas following Aristotle means change in, in general. Uh, not just motion as we uh, tend to think of it these days, not just movement from place to place, that is to say. And what the argument seeks to show is that no change at all would be possible here and now unless there were a first unmoved mover or unchanged changer, which is moving or changing everything here and now. For those who are interested, I defend two of Aquinas' other arguments in The Last Superstition. I discuss three uh, of Aquinas' arguments. And, and it's important to emphasize there, uh, uh, as I may have discussed last night, these are not just Aquinas' arguments. Sometimes people object to the sort of defense I would give of, uh, of God's existence, as I appeal to Aquinas frequently, by saying, well, how plausible is it that one guy, this guy Thomas Aquinas, could have hit upon it, hit upon the truth, and everyone else before and after was wrong. It's important to emphasize that um, Aquinas, when he gives these arguments, is not inventing them out of whole cloth. He didn't make these arguments up. What he's doing is presenting, and at most somewhat refining, I, arguments that really have a long history, both before his time and afterward. They began, as I indicated, with Plato and Aristotle, uh, and they've continued uh, to be developed and defended by other Thomists, followers of Aquinas, since Aquinas' time. Uh, so we're talking about arguments that have a long history of, of very prominent, very eminent uh, defenders. Um, and I discuss all of the five ways in greater depth in my book on Aquinas, which is titled, very creatively, Aquinas. <laughs> uh, now, to understand the argument from motion or change, the one we're going to focus on tonight, we need to say something about how Aquinas understands change. Following Aristotle, he takes motion or change always to involve a transition from potentiality to actuality, from things being potentially a certain way to them being actually that way. <clears throat> For example, when a billiard ball rolls into the corner pocket, it goes from being merely potentially in the corner pocket to being actually in the corner pocket. When a rubber ball in a microwave oven melts, it goes from being potentially soft and gooey to being actually soft and gooey. When a dog moves its leg, its muscles go from having the potential to flex to actually flexing, and so forth. For Aristotle and Aquinas, <clears throat> there's no way to explain how change is possible at all unless we suppose that things have within them the potential to become what they become. <clears throat> the, the billiard ball could not pe uh, possibly enter the corner pocket unless it first had the potential to do so. The rubber ball couldn't melt unless it had the potential to melt. The dog's leg muscles could not flex unless they had the potential to flex, and so on and so forth. Now, this might seem to be a very simple and obvious point, and at one level it is. 
But as it happens, the Aristotelian distinction between actuality and potentiality, or between act and potency, to use the more traditional jargon, has tremendous philosophical significance and has been a matter of considerable philosophical controversy. Aristotle first introduced it in order to explain what was wrong with the view of the pre-Socratic philosophers Parmenides and Zeno that change is impossible. Uh, Parmenides notoriously argued uh, that change was impossible. Nothing ever changes. If your senses tell you, you say, well, Phaser's up there flapping his lips. That's change, right? Uh, he's going from not speaking to speaking, right? And talking and talking and talking, right? So change is possible, right? Parmenides says it's not possible. Uh, how can he be right? Parmenides says, who are you going to believe, me or your lying eyes, right? Uh, he wanted to argue that change is not possible because reason tells you that it's impossible. Reason tells you that the very idea of change is incoherent, and so you shouldn't believe your senses. Parmenides was maybe the first of the rationalists in this sense, that reason has priority over sensory experience and should be trusted when it conflicts with sensory experience. His argument for this claim is actually a bit complicated, but to, to simplify it, uh, Parmenides argues that to change would be to go from non-being to being. The idea being that, well, if any change occurs, right, so Phaser's not talking, and then suddenly he's talking, right, his talking has to go from not happening to happening, has to go from non non-existence to existence, from non-being to being, so Parmenides says. Okay, so change would have to involve going from non-being to being. But that's absurd, Parmenides argued, since non-being is just nothing and something can come from nothing. No, from nothing, nothing comes. Something can't come from, from nothing. So there go, therefore, uh, ergo, change is impossible, Parmenides argues. Now, there's more to it than that, but that's the basic idea. Now, what Parmenides overlooked, according to Aristotle, is that between non-being on the one hand and unqualified being or actuality on the other, there is potency or potentiality. Again, the rubber ball is not actually soft and gooey, but it is at least potentially that way. And this potentiality is what makes change possible. Aristotle would say that Parmenides and Zeno, his disciple Zeno, were simply too crude in their understanding of how change would have to, to work. It's not a matter of going from absolute non-being to actuality, to complete being, but going from potential existence. There is in the rubber ball, though it's not actually squishy and gooey, the potential to be that way, which other things don't have, right? You stick a block of granite in the microwave, it's not gonna melt, but you stick the rubber ball in, it will. The, 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 the ball has a, a potency or potential to melt at that temperature, uh, in a way that the block of granite does not. So we can say something about it that's true even though it's not actually the case. It has a potentiality that hasn't yet been actualized. And that's what makes change possible. That basic point, the distinction between actual and potential, is the key to seeing what's wrong with Parmenides. Now, notice that insofar as the ball has the potential to be soft and gooey, even before it is melted down, and even if it's never melted, right, the rubber ball has that potential or potency, even if you keep it in a drawer and you never stick it in the microwave, you never put it out in the sun, it never, it never actually melts. It still has that poten potency or potentiality. Uh, notice that it has a kind of disposition, you might say, and therefore points to or is directed at a certain effect or manifestation. Built into the nature of the thing, insofar as it has the potential to melt, is a tendency to point to that outcome under the right conditions. In other words, it exhibits final causality or teleology in the way, in the sense that we discussed last night. There is a deep connection between the distinction between act and potency or actuality and potentiality on the one hand and the notion of final causality or teleology on the other hand. It is no surprise then that the new essentialist philosophers that we discussed last night in resurrecting the idea of dispositions or causal powers and teleology along with them, have also emphasized the distinction between what they call categorical properties and dispositional ones, which is just kind of a fancy modern way of talking about the old actuality, potentiality distinction. Here's another way in which they're basically resurrecting Aristotelian ideas. Some of them are well aware of this, some of them are not, but it's basically uh, a, a neo-Aristotelian approach coming from people who are in no way interested in defending God's existence or, uh, or they're not Thomists or what have you. So it's sort of developed independently. Nor is it any surprise that with the abandonment of final causality in early modern philosophy and the work of people like Descartes, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke and others, uh, that attention to and even awareness of Aristotle's actuality, potentiality distinction virtually disappeared. And that with it, uh, away with it went a proper understanding of what Aquinas was trying to do in arguments like the first way. 
for the act potency or actuality potentiality distinction is crucial to the argument. And indeed, in one way or the other, to uh, all of Aquinas' arguments. It really plays a role in the other arguments, too. Excuse me. Now, how exactly does a potential become actualized? To return to my examples, the ball melting into goo and the dog walking, how does the ball's potential gooiness, that's a word, come into being, and how do the dog's muscles actualize their potential to be flexed? Well, it cannot happen by itself, for a potential is by itself just that. It's merely potential, not actual or real. So that no potential can make itself actual, but must be actualized by something outside it. Hence, a rubber ball's potential to be melted must be actualized by heat. <coughs> the potential of an animal's leg to move must be actualized by the firing of the motor neurons, and so forth. What we have here, of course, is a cause and effect relationship. But notice that it is not a relationship between events separated in, in time, like the throwing of a brick, which is followed a second or two later by the shattering of a window. Rather, the causes and effects in the cases at hand are simultaneous. The effect of the rubber ball melting is simultaneous with the heat's causing it to melt. The effect of the dog's muscles flexing is simultaneous with the neurons causing them to flex. To take another example, Aristotelian philosophers like to use, when a potter makes a pot, the effect of the pot's taking on a curved shape is simultaneous with the potter's hand taking a, a curved position as he molds it. In general, for Aristotle and Aquinas, the immediate cause of a thing is always, is always simultaneous with it. Now, by the same token, the curved position of the potter's hand is itself immediately caused by whatever events in his nervous system keep the muscles in his hand flexed in such and such a way. But of course, we can also point to other less immediate causes uh, of the curved position of his hand. For example, it was remotely caused by the fact that his girlfriend asked him last week to make a pot for her, uh, for he wouldn't be sitting here right now curving his hand in just that way if she hadn't made this request. This brings us to a crucial distinction that Aquinas and other medieval philosophers made between two kinds of series of causes and effects, namely accidentally ordered and essentially ordered series, or causal series uh, ordered per accidents and per se. Um, and here, I can make reference to the handout, or one side of it, I think it's two-sided. Uh, and you'll see a little chart there on accidentally ordered versus essentially ordered causal series, summarizing some of the crucial differences between them, which I'm going to describe now. <coughs> to take a, stop, a stock example of an accidentally ordered causal series, Consider a father who begets a son who in turn begets another. If the father dies after begetting his son, the son can still beget a son of his own. For once in existence, the son has the power to do this all by himself. He doesn't need his father to remain in existence for him to be able to do it. <clears throat> if we imagine an ongoing series of fathers begetting sons who in turn beget others, and of course such series really do exist all around us, then we can observe that in every case, each son has the power to beget a son of his own and thus become a father, even if his own father or any previous father in the series goes out of existence. Considered as a causer of sons, if you will, each member of this series is in this sense independent of the previous members. Hence, the series is accidentally ordered in the sense that it is not essential to the continuation of the series that any earlier member of it remain in existence. And in the same way, the potter's curved, uh, curving his hand in making the pot occurs even though his girlfriend's request happened a week ago. The causal link between her request and the potter's hand's curving is also accidental in the, in the relevant sense, insofar as the latter exists in the absence of the former. So that's one kind of cause and effect relationship. Call it an accidentally ordered cause, cause and effect relationship. And it's the kind we normally have in mind. We think of series of causes arranged in a linear way through a, a span of time illustrated on the handout there by that, you know, that straight line, A causes B, which causes C, and so forth. Um, now, the potter's hands being, hand being curved would, would not exist in the absence of the firing of the motor neurons. Here we have an essentially ordered causal series, and we have one precisely because the cause in this case is, unlike the girlfriend's request, simultaneous with the effect. The hand is held in the position that it is in only because the motor neurons are firing in such and such a way. Take away the neural activity and the hand goes limp. Or, once again to make use of a stock example, if we think of the hand which is pushing a, st a stone by means of a stick, this is Aquinas' example, uh, and it's there on the handout, the motion of the stone occurs only insofar as the stick is moving it. And if the stick, uh, and the stick is moving only insofar as it is being used by the hand to do so. 
At every moment in which the last part of the series, that is the motion of the stone, uh, exists, the earlier parts, the motion of the hand and the stick, exist as well. The stone and the stick itself, for that matter, only move because and insofar as the hand moves them. Indeed, strictly speaking, it is the hand alone which is doing the moving of the stone, and the stick is a mere instrument by means of which it accomplishes this. The series is essentially ordered, quote unquote, because the later members of the series, having no independent power of motion, uh, derive the fact of their motion and their ability to move other things from the first member, in this case, the hand. Without the earlier members, and particularly the first one, the series could not continue. Okay, that's the, uh, that's the basic distinction between essentially an accidentally ordered series. Now, an accidentally ordered series, like the fathers beginning sons who beget more sons, and indeed like the countless other causal series familiar from everyday experience uh, that extend backwards in time, could, in Aquinas' view, in theory, go back forever into the past. He doesn't think any such series does, in fact, go, go, uh, go back forever, but he also doesn't think it can be proved through philosophical arguments that they don't. I, this is one area where I think Aquinas was mistaken, but it's not relevant to the point here. His view is that, well, we can't prove through philosophy or science alone that if you trace a series of essentially ordered causes back in time that you must reach a beginning point. Um, that was his position. Um, and that's why he didn't think you could prove that, that the universe had an origin and that he wasn't going to uh, bother with that sort of question in the, in the course of arguing for God's existence. Uh, the reason is that since an accidentally ordered in an accidentally ordered series, the members of the series have their causal powers independently of the operation or even the existence of earlier members, there's nothing about the activity of the members existing here and now that requires that we trace it back to some first member existing in the past. So in an, in an, an accidentally ordered causal series, like the sun beginning a further sun and so forth, What's, it's the son who's begetting a son of his own. It's not that the father is begetting this grandson through the son. The son has this independent causal power. So to explain what's going on here and now in that sort of series, you don't need to appeal to the father or the grandfather or the great-grandfather. You can just stop with the son himself and his independent power to generate new sons. And for that reason, Aquinas wants to say, there's no grounds to say that the series must have some first member because you don't have to appeal to a first member who's moving through all the other ones, working through all the other ones as instruments, though the way you have in an essentially ordered causal series. Things are different uh, than with an essentially ordered causal series. These sorts of series trace not backwards in time, but rather downward or upward, depending on what sort of metaphor you want to use, in the present moment, since they are a series in which each member depends simultaneously on other members, which simultaneously depend in turn on yet others, and so on. In this sort of series, the later members have no independent causal power of their own. That's really the, the crucial idea here. Every member except the first one has no independent power. It's, it's, it's only, it can only do anything insofar as it's being used as an instrument of something else. They have no independent causal power of their own, being mere instruments of a first member. Hence, if there were no first member, such a series would not exist at all. If the last member of such series does in fact exist then, as the motion of the stone does in our example, this series cannot even in theory go back inf infinitely. There must be a first member. That's just the nature of that kind of causation, essentially ordered causation, that kind of series. And that is the sort of series Aquinas, as I indicate there in the bottom of the handout, that's the sort of series he's talking about when he says that a, the series of causes cannot go back to infinity. If you take a look at the other side of the handout, you see on the top I have a little outline there of Aquinas' first way, which corresponds pretty closely to what he says in the Summa. Um, when he says that uh, the series of changers, one thing moving another can't be infinite, uh, what he means then is not that if you trace it back in time you'll get to a Big Bang and then we ask what caused the Big Bang. He's not interested in that at all. He's talking about the causes and effects going on here and now in an essentially ordered way. And it's that sort of series, he says, must have necessarily, of its very nature, a first member. All right, now we'll come back to that. With that background in place, we can finally proceed to the argument from motion itself, the one I've got uh, Aquinas' version of there outlined on the top of the handout. Consider once again the hand, the stone, and the stick. The stone, as I've said, moves only insofar as the stick moves, and the stick moves only insofar as the hand moves. More technically, but more precisely, the stone's potentiality for motion is actualized by the stick, 
but only because simultaneously the stick's potentiality for motion is actualized by the hand. That's where we left things when I first set up the example a few moments ago, treating the hand for purposes of illustration uh, as if it were a first mover. But of course, in fact, the hand is not really the first member of the series at all. It moves only because the arm moves it, and the arm and hand together move only because the relevant muscles flex, which is in turn due to the firing of certain neurons. That is to say, the hand's potentiality for motion is actualized by the arm, the arm's potentiality for motion is actualized by the muscles, the muscle's potentiality for motion is actualized by the nerves. And again, all of this is simultaneous. But even this isn't the end of the series. It continues on through a number of simultaneous steps to ever deeper levels of reality. The motion of the stone depends on the motion of the hand, which depends on the motion of the stick, which depends on the firing of the neurons, which depends on the firing of other neurons, all of which depends on the state of the nervous system, which depends on its current molecular structure, which depends on the atomic basis of, the, of that molecular structure, which depends on electromagnetism, gravitation, the weak and strong forces, and so on and so forth, all simultaneously, all here and now. The actualization, to put it in somewhat more technical but more precise, I think, jargon, is that the actualization of one potential depends on the simultaneous actualization of another, which depends on the simultaneous actualization of another, which depends on the simultaneous actualization of another, which depends on how far can this go? Not that far, actually. Certainly not to infinity. For what we have here is an essentially ordered causal series existing here and now, not an accidentally ordered one extending backwards to the past. And an essentially ordered series of its nature must have a first member. All the later members of such a series exist at all, only insofar as the earlier ones do, and those earlier ones only insofar as yet earlier ones do. But were there, no, were there finally no first member of the series, there'd be no series at all in the first place, because it is only the first member which is in the strictest sense really doing or actualizing anything. The later members are mere instruments with no independent actualizing power of their own. Suppose you see the caboose of a train, give some illustrations here of the, of the basic concept. Suppose you see the caboose of a train pulling out at the station and demand to know what's pulling it. A freight car, you were told. What's pulling that? Another freight car. And that? Yet another freight car. All true enough. But none of these answers really explains anything because the freight cars like the caboose have no independent power of motion of their own and so no appeal to freight cars explains anything at least uh, or even if the series of cars pulling the caboose went on to infinity. What is needed is an appeal to something that does have the power of movement in itself, such as an engine car. Similarly, should you see through, the hole in the f through a hole in the fence, say, a paintbrush coating the fence with paint and ask what is causing it to do so, the answer, the brush handle, will not explain anything, since a brush handle has no independent power of movement. And this wouldn't change in the least, even if we imagine the brush handle was infinitely long. It's not like, well, a short brush handle can't move itself, it needs a hand to move it. But if you had an infinitely long brush handle, that would explain everything. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't add anything to the explanatory picture. And this wouldn't change in the least, even if we imagine that the brush handle was uh, infinitely long. Again, the only genuine explanation would be something that did have independent power of movement and could therefore move the otherwise inert brush. The same thing is true of the sequence beginning with the moving stone. No member of the series has any indep independent causal power of its own, but derives what it has from something earlier in the series. As with the railway cars and the paintbrush, this series too must terminate in a first mover which moves all the others, indeed moves through all the others. Now a first mover in this sort of series itself must be unmoved or unchanging. For if it were moving or changing, that is, if it was itself going from potential to actual, then there would have to be something outside it actualizing its potential, in which case it wouldn't be the first mover. Not only must it be unmoved, though, it must be unmovable, unchangeable. For notice <clears throat> that especially toward the lower levels of the series we were considering, we get to the nervous systems being actualized by its molecular structure, which is in turn actualized by its atomic structure, etc. What we have is the potential existence of one level actualized by the existence of another, which is in turn actualized by another, and so forth. The existence of neurons is actualized by the molecular structure, the existence of the molecular structure is actualized by the atomic structure, and so on. To account for the actualization of the potential motion of the stone, we had eventually to appeal to the actualization of the potential existence of various deeper levels of reality. 
And here, uh, I, I'm going beyond what Aquinas actually says in the text of the first way, and I'm considering the argument as it's been understood in the, in the longer Thomistic tradition. Uh, and I, I, would, I would certainly argue that the, the basic idea of the argument for motion, which is really about the actualization of potential rather than a specific kind of motion or change, leads us ultimately uh, to give a final explanation of the, the motion we started out with, like the stone, to uh, the need to explain the existence of the stone, the existence of the stick moving the stone, and so on and so forth. But then the only way to stop this regress and to arrive at a first member of the series is with a being whose existence does not need to be actualized by anything else. The series can only stop, that is to say, with a being that is pure actuality or pure act, as the medieval scholastic philosophers would put it, with no admixture of potentiality whatsoever. And having no potentiality to realize or actualize, such a being could not possibly move or change. Doesn't come into being, doesn't go out of existence, doesn't change in any, change in any respect. It is pure being, pure existence, pure actuality. That a stone is moved by a hand via a stick then, and more generally that things change at all, suffices to show that there is and indeed must be a first unmovable mover or unchangeable changer. Now that is all pretty abstract, I realize, so much so that it might seem jarring when Aquinas goes on to say, quote, and this we call God, as he does at the end of the, the first way. What he means by this is that whatever else people might have in mind when they use the expression God, because obviously the the proverbial man on the street doesn't think of God as pure actuality or in, in these, uh, er, you know, these sort of abstract uh, Aristotelian terms. But Aquinas' point is that whatever else we have in mind when we use the expression God, we mean to refer to whatever being it is that is the ultimate explanation of the processes of change we observe in the world around us. God is the ultimate cause of everything. I mean, that certainly is part of the, the ordinary man on the street's idea of God, even if he doesn't think of it in these highfalutin technical uh, scholastic terms. It turns out that there really is such a being. And it also turns out uh, that what it means for there to be uh, such a being is for there to be a being describable in philosophical terms as pure actuality, even if this has, of course, never occurred to most people who believe in God. All well and good, you might be thinking, but what does that have to do with God as the average person understands him? A lot, actually. For once we have this much in hand, we can go on to deduce all sorts of things about what a being of pure actuality would have to be like. And it turns out that such a being would have to be exactly like the god of traditional Western religious be uh, belief. I keep saying a being, and I'm, I'm speaking very loosely here, as, as any good Thomas will tell you, God is not a being, he is being, being itself, rather than one being among others. So I'm speaking loosely here. For example, there cannot possibly be more than one being who is pure actuality. Hence, the argument from motion leads inevitably to a kind of monotheism. One reason for this is that in order for there to be two or more purely actual beings, there would have to be some way, in principle at least, of distinguishing them. Some feature that one of them had that the other one lacked, and there just couldn't be any such feature. For to lack a feature is just to have an unrealized potentiality, and a purely actual being, by definition, has no unrealized potentialities. He's already, as it were, pure actuality. There's nothing there to be to be actualized, no potentiality. So if we said, for example, that one purely actual being was more powerful than another, that that is what distinguished the, him from the other one, then we'd be saying, in effect, that the other purely actual being had failed to realize this potential for power as fully as the first had, say. Which makes no sense, given that what we're talking about is a purely actual being with no potentialities of any sort. So again, there's no feature that one purely actual being could have that another could lack, and thus no way even in theory to distinguish one purely actual being from another. So there couldn't be more than one. There's a lot more to it than that, but the idea is that when you unpack the concept of pure actuality, of God as what actualizes or makes real everything else without himself having to be actualized or makes real. He is pure existence, pure reality, pure actuality. When you unpack that, you'll see you can't make sense of the idea of there being more than one such cause of the world necessarily unique. A being of pure actuality lacking any potentiality whatsoever would also have to be immaterial. It's not a material object. It's not just the universe, say, or some prior material universe that caused this one or, or any of these other sort of material causes. Since to be a material thing entails being changeable in various ways, which a purely actual being cannot be. <clears throat> Such a being would not come into existence or go out of existence both of these being instances of change, but simply exist always. 
In fact, he would have to be eternal or outside of time and space altogether, since to be within time and space also, also entails changeability. The unmoved mover is, in any event, the source to which every motion or change in the material universe, not just moving stones, but melting glaciers, orbiting moons, budding flowers, growing boys and girls, and so on through all of nature, traces back. Being the common first member of all the various essentially ordered causal series that result in these ins instances of change, the unmoved mover is outside and distinct from them uh, as that which sustains the entire world in motion from instant to instant. <coughs> Excuse me. So just from what has been said so far, we can see that the unmoved mover or, or unchangeable changer must be absolutely unique, immutable, or unchangeable, immaterial, or pure spirit, eternal, and outside of time and space. Obviously, there's a lot more to the arguments for these attributes than what I've said here, but I'm just trying to give you a little sense of the, uh, the general approach. Can we say more than this? We can, by way of the Aristotelian principle, that whatever is in an effect must in some sense be contained in its cause as well. This is an idea that's sometimes called in the scholastic literature the, um, uh, the principle of proportionate causality. The basic idea is that a cause cannot give to its effect what it does not have to give, and it can be illustrated by a simple example. Suppose you come across a puddle of water near an outdoor spigot, an outdoor faucet. You'll naturally conclude that the puddle was caused by the spigot, either because someone turned it on or, or because it's leaking. The effect is a puddle of water and the cause is something fully capable of producing that effect since it contains water in it already. But now suppose instead that you come across a puddle of thick, sticky, dark, dark, uh, dark red liquid near the same spigot. In this case, you will not conclude that the faucet was the cause, at least not by itself. The reason is that there's nothing in the spigot or faucet alone that could produce this specific effect, or at least not every feature of the effect. It could produce a puddle of liquid all right, and maybe even a puddle of vaguely reddish liquid if there was rust in the line, but not a puddle of thick, sticky, dark red liquid specifically. You'd be likely to conclude instead that someone had spilled a can of soda pop near the spigot, or perhaps someone had been bleeding heavily nearby. Even if these possibilities had been ruled out, and you had evidence that the puddle came from the spigot after all, you conclude that somehow such a thick red liquid, blood, soda, or whatever, had somehow been put into the water line, or that, it, or that if it had not, there must have been something on the ground that when mixed with water from the spigot chemically produced this thick red liquid. What you would never seriously consider is the suggestion that normal water from the uh, faucet all by itself produced the red puddle. For there's just nothing in water by itself that could produce the redness, thickness, or stickiness of the puddle. There must have been something in addition to the water that produced the effect. Halfway expected to see red, thick, bloody, okay. <laughs> freaking myself out here, okay. As this example illustrates, an effect might be contained in its cause in various ways. It could be that the cause was itself red, as blood or cherry soda pop is red even before it causes a red puddle. But it could also be that the cause was not itself red, but had the power to generate redness in the effect. For example, neither the water nor some chemical substance spread on the ground uh, like a ground up fizzy drink tablet or something might be red, yet it will produce a thick red liquid when combined. Or to take another example, the cause of a fire might itself be on fire, as when a torch is used to start a brush fire, or it may instead have the power to produce fire, as a cigarette lighter has even when it's not being used. The traditional way of making this distinction is to say that a cause has the feature that it generates in the effect formally in the first sort of case, for example, when both the cause and effect are red or on fire. They both have the form of being on fire, the form of red. So the idea is that what's in the effect is, also, is in the cause formally. That's the technical jargon. And it's in the cause eminently in the second sort of case. For example, when the cause is not itself red or on fire, but it has an inherent power to produce redness or fire. Or you could think of the way, uh, another sort of example, when an architect produces a house that's made out of bricks and it's two stories high and it's uh, red and so forth. Well, the architect himself isn't made out of bricks, right? He's not, uh, he, does not he doesn't have two stories, you know. Uh, how many stories does your architect have, right? What are you talking about, his life story? Uh, he doesn't have stories in that sense at all. But nevertheless, what's in the house is in the architect in yet another way, as an idea, as a concept in his intellect. So there are different ways in which what's in the effect might be in the cause. It doesn't always have to be in the same way. All right. Now, if a cause didn't contain all the features of its effect, either formally or eminently, it didn't have it in some way, 
in, in, uh, in itself. The cause didn't have in itself what, it, uh, what, uh, what, what was in the effect. There would be no way to account for how the effect came about in just the way that it did. We couldn't make sense of the cause and effect relationship in the first place. Again, a cause cannot give to its effect what it does not have to give. You can only give what you've got. A principle Aristotelian philosophers, as I say, call the principle of proportionate causality. Now, with this principle in hand, let's return to the unmoved mover or unchangeable changer. Since he's the source of all change, he's the source of all things coming to have the attributes that they have. Hence, he must have these attributes eminently, if not formally. That is to say, if he does not have these attributes in precisely the way uh, that the things he causes have, he must have them in some higher or more eminent way. For example, if he doesn't have attributes like color, weight, or shape, which of course he does not have since he's not a material object, he would nevertheless have to have something like, say, the ideas or concepts of color, weight, and shape, and the power to cause these things. Otherwise, he couldn't be the ultimate explanation of why things come to have these features, which we have seen that he, hit, that he is. But the unmoved mover or unchangeable changer is the source of every attribute things have, including every power. As their source, then, he must be all-powerful. He is also the source of the intellect and will that human beings possess, features that make us persons rather than mere animals or inanimate objects, and capable of knowing or understanding the world around us. It follows that the unmoved mover or unchangeable changer must be said to have something analogous to intellect and will, and thus knowledge and personality. That is to say, he, he is indeed a he and not an it, or some impersonal force. Moreover, he must have these various attributes in the highest degree, since, as we've seen, he would, uh, he would lack any of the limitations that go along with being a material creature or with having any sort of potentiality. Hence, he not only has knowledge, but knowledge without limit. He would be all-knowing. To show that an unmoved mover or unchangeable changer exists, then, is just to show that there is a single being who is the cause of all change, himself unchangeable, immaterial, eternal, personal, having intelligence and will, all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good. It is, in short, to show that there is a God in the traditional sense. Now, that is actually just the sketch of the argument. It could be pursued in much greater detail. In, in particular, <clears throat> much more could be said in response to the various objections that atheists might try to raise against this line of reasoning. But enough has been said already to show how wide of the mark certain stock atheist criticisms are. For example, you'll find a great many atheist writers, Richard Dawkins among them, who claim that even if it could be shown that there is a first cause or unmoved mover, no one has ever given a reason to think that this cause would be all-powerful, all-knowing, or in other ways like the god of traditional religious belief. That's a stock objection. That, well, even if, you get, even if we gave you a cause of the world, uh, there's no reason to think that it has any of the features we traditionally attribute to God, something with intellect, will, power, knowledge, and so on and so forth, that there's only one of them, and so on and so forth. Uh, but that claim, though extremely common, is, is simply false. Indeed, it is breathtaking that so many atheist writers get away with saying this so frequently. In fact, many of the great philosophical theologians, and Aquinas is just the most eminent of them, certainly not the only one, devote literally hundreds of pages of rigorous philosophical argument to showing that a first cause or unmoved mover would have to have all the various divine attributes. And though I've just given a sketch of how this can be shown, hopefully I've said enough to give the lie to this particular atheist cliche. It's very uh, annoying. It's one of my many pet peeves um, that, you know, it, it, someone like Richard Dawkins can say, well, you know, even if Aquinas got us to a first cause, it doesn't tell us anything about why this first cause is uh, all-powerful, all-knowing. And I want to say just, you know, Dawkins, turn the page, man. I mean, all he's ever read, apparently, is a snippet of Aquinas, probably the five ways, something he read in a philosophy anthology when he was an undergraduate, but clearly not the, the Summa Theologi Theologiae itself, because if you look at that book, right after Aquinas gives you the five ways, which are only, were only ever intended as a little summary, a sketch of arguments he develops at much greater length elsewhere, and that would have just been familiar, would have been just in the air, as it were, in the, during the time in which he wrote. You just turn the page and you see that he immediately launches into a very long, hundreds of pages long, um, set of arguments for the different divine attributes. So far from being the case that uh, these defenders of the traditional arguments only at best ever get you to a cause of the world, but never tell you anything about the nature of this cause, it's just simply untrue. No one could possibly say that he's actually read Aquinas or Samuel Clark or any of the other, uh, or Leibniz, or any of the other great defenders of uh, the idea of God as cause of the world. Now, <clears throat> atheist writers also often claim 
that even if it could be shown that there was a first cause, we couldn't know whether this being still exists here and now. It's the deadbeat dad theory of God, you know, that, well, maybe he caused the world, but he took off, right? Uh, maybe we should go after him for child support. You know, if Dawkins thought of that, he'd probably have a crusade, you know, let's sue God, you know, for, uh, anyway. Um, we've seen, though, why this objection is no good. As I've emphasized, the argument for motion that we've been sketching out does not say that we need to trace the history of the universe back to the Big Bang and postulate God as the cause of the Big Bang which of course would raise the question of how we could know that this cause is still around. No, the argument says instead that if we are going to explain any change or motion going on here and now, including even my speaking this very sentence, including Richard Dawkins uttering a blasphemy, or Christopher Hitchens ordering a scotch, then there logically must be an unmoved mover or unchangeable changer who's causing such change or motion to occur here and now. This would remain true whether or not the universe had a beginning, a question which, at least for the purposes of proving God's existence, is in Aquinas' view irrelevant. We can also see that the stock objection uh, to the phantom, everything has a cause, so the universe has a cause argument, is irrelevant. Aquinas doesn't say everything has a cause or that everything is in motion. If you look at the little outline of his argument I gave there, uh, you'll see there's, there's nothing like that premise. What he says is, what goes, if something goes from potential to actual, there must be something outside that makes that happen. But that's very different from saying everything has uh, a cause. What you see in the bottom half of that handout, by the way, uh, I noted earlier that Aquinas speaks in terms of motion or change. Uh, in Aquinas' day, everyone would have understood that what that means from an Aristotelian point of view is going from potency to act or potential to actual. These days, uh, people are very, you know, they're just not used to that sort of jargon. Uh, I think it's more helpful even though a bit more difficult to get your mind around it, but once you sort of get used to that jargon of potency and act, it's more useful, it's far less misleading to state the argument in those terms. So what I've got there on the second half of the handout is the way I would restate the argument without using the, 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 the concept of, without using the term, I should say motion or change, but just stating the, uh, the basic thrust of the argument in terms of the actualization of potency. So that's, you got a little reconstruction there on the bottom half of the handout. All right. Um, what Aquinas does do is just to note that there are things that are moving or changing in that sense, going from potency to act, and shows that uh, this would not be possible even in theory, wouldn't be possible even in theory for something to go from potential to actual here and now, um, unless there were something that is not moving or changing or being caused in any way, something that could not be moved or changed, uh, could not be moved or changed, or in any other way dependent on some cause outside itself operating here and now to make all this happen. And the reason this unmoved mover or first cause cannot just be the universe itself is that whatever the unmoved mover or first cause is must be pure actuality without any potentiality and thus itself incapable of change, which of course the ever-changing material universe is not. Finally, we might note that the argument is also immune to what might seem to be a more serious objection from modern science. Someone might ask, doesn't Newton's principle of inertia the principle that a body in motion tends to stay in motion unless acted upon from outside, undermine the claim of Aristotle, Aquinas, and other defenders of the argument for motion that whatever is moving must here and now be moved by something else. For if it's just a law of physics that bodies will, all things being equal, remain in motion, then why would there be a need to appeal to anything outside them in order to account for their continued movement? Now, this objection, too, I would claim, is irrelevant to the argument for several reasons. First of them is that uh, Newton's principle applies only to, to what is called local motion or movement from one place to another, while the sort of motion the argument, from, the argument from motion is concerned with is broader and concerns change in general, change of any sort. Not just movement from place to place, but also changes in quality, like water's becoming solid when it freezes, changes in quantity, like it's becoming hotter or colder by degrees, and changes in substance, as when hydrogen and oxygen are combined to make water. So even if we were to grant that the local motion of an object needn't be accounted for by reference to something outside it, there would still be other kinds of motion to which the argument from motion would apply. I and mean, that's one move you could make. I don't think it's the most fundamental one, though. Um, someone might try to argue that those other kinds of motion might be reduced to local motion. I don't think that actually works for several reasons. But the, the, more, the more fundamental response, though, is this. The most fundamental problem with the Newtonian objection is that the operation of Newton's law is itself something that needs to be explained. It's no good saying, oh, things keep moving because, uh, you know, that's just what they do given the principle of inertia. If we want to know why things are governed by this principle, 
Uh, it's no good just to say, well, you know, it's a law of physics that things operate that way. Okay, what does that mean? What, do you mean? what does it mean to say it's a law that they operate that way? What does that mean if it's not, well, they just operate that way because, you know, that's the way things operate? A brilliant explanation, right? Uh, that's not, that's not going to do. The analytical Thomist philosopher David Brain characterizes this sort of thinking as beholden to what he aptly calls the mythology of inertia. And he quotes the following lines from Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein's Tractatus to indicate what is wrong with it. It's a quote from uh, the early Wittgenstein, quote, the whole modern conception of the world is founded on the illusion that the so-called laws of nature are the explanations of natural phenomena. Thus, people today stop at the laws of nature, treating them as something inviolable, just as God and fate were treated in past ages. And in fact, both are right and both wrong. Though the view of the ancients is clearer insofar as they have a clear and acknowledged terminus, while the modern system tries to make it look as if everything were explained." Unquote. From an Aristotelian point of view, talk of, quote, laws of nature uh, can really only just be shorthand for a description of how things tend to behave given their natures, their forms, their essences. Uh, but that just raises the question of why a thing exists with the nature, form, or essence that it has. Part of the answer is that a certain parcel of matter has taken on that form, nature, or essence. But this brings us back to the distinction between actuality and potentiality. For from an Aristotelian point of view, matter considered by itself is purely potential unless actualized by some form or nature. But the form, nature, essence of a material thing considered by itself is in turn an abstraction. It exists in the real world only insofar as some matter has taken on that form or essence. The Aristotelian analysis of material objects is holistic. Form exists only in matter, but matter exists only insofar as it has form, only insofar as it is informed. For that reason, the form, nature, or essence of a thing, and thus the laws that it follows, including Newton's, law, including Newton's laws, can never be its ultimate explanation. We need to appeal to something outside the composite of form and matter, of actuality and potentiality, if we're to avoid vicious circularity. And only what is purely actual, what can actualize other things without being actualized itself. Um, it's not a bit of matter, or more broadly, potentiality, which is being actualized. It just is pure actuality. Only something like that. In short, God, as conceived of in the Aristotelian Thomistic tradition, can, even in principle, be the terminus of explanation. That which keeps the form and matter together, that which keeps the laws of physics going, as it were, from moment to moment to moment. As Aquinas puts it, to say that God made the world is more like saying, the musician made music, than it is like saying the blacksmith made a horseshoe. The world is not like a horseshoe. It's not some artifact that God made all at once at some point in the past and which might carry on by itself even in his absence. The world is more like a melody played by a violinist, where if the violinist stops playing, even for an instant, then the music stops too. We are, as it were, all mere notes in God's melody and would not be able to so much as lift a finger were he not continuously moving his own fingers across the violin strings. He is at every moment creating us, keeping us in existence, including those who deny his existence, and even as they foolishly deny it. Thank you. Do you have time for questions? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm just wondering, when you mentioned that how uh, the, the essential order proves that we have an unmovable mover or unchangeable <coughs> changer, mm -hmm. and that this um, is a construct of the, the Western idea of God, um, and you switch to using the male you know, pronoun he, mm -hmm. he has all these traits, and that it's mm -hmm. not an it necessarily, but yeah. if the um, <coughs> unchangeable changer or whatever encompasses everything that's in our universe that we see, that we observe. Um, I don't see how that is necessarily limited to our view of like a personality. Like, I mean, it seems like when you say that it has, a, or he has a personality, mm -hmm. because of that, it's not it. I would think that a personality in itself would be limiting. Yeah, well, I, I what I, the most I could do in the talk was sort of sketch out the argument for God as uh, as having intellect and will, and it's a, it's a very good question. Um, one one thing I want to emphasize is that uh, for the for the classical theistic tradition that uh, Aquinas represents, for for writers like Aristotle, Aquinas, 
and all the other great scholastics and so forth. Um, God, when we say, we attribute these personal attributes to God, like intellect and will, we say that uh, in, there's a sense in which God has intellect, God wills things and so forth. What we mean is not that God is a person like we are, um, but you might say that it's rather that God is not less than personal. He's in fact higher than personal, but he's not less than personal the way that he would be if we thought of him on the model of a, a tree or a natural process or an animal or something like that. So if we're, if we're going to capture God's nature, we have, to, we have to make it clear that whatever is in God is something higher than what we call personhood in us and not lower than that. That's really the, the key point. So there must be in God something, as Aquinas would put it, there must be in God something that's at least analogous to intellect and will. It's certainly higher, infinitely higher than what we have uh, in ourselves, when what we think of as intellect, thought, and so forth, and will in ourselves. The point is it's not lower than that. In that sense, God is more like us than he's like uh, uh, an animal or a stone or a tree or, or what have you. That, that's one point. Another point, of course, is from the, uh, the Christian point of view, it would be a mistake to describe God as, quote, a person insofar as the Christian conception of God is Trinitarian. So strictly you'd say God is three persons in one substance, not a person. That, now that's a separate point. That's a point from theology rather than, uh, rather than philosophy. Now you also mentioned um, reference to God as, I thought, I, I thought at first you were going to ask why he rather than she and so forth. And of course that's a big topic that's sort of tangential to this one. The short answer to that I would say, is there, there are both philosophical and theological reasons for that. And the, the philosophical reason for that is the idea that at least uh, traditionally you tend to find um, maternal or feminine descriptions of God in more pantheistic uh, religions, where you tend to find masculine descriptions of God uh, it, more in uh, classical theistic, monotheistic religions like Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. Now, why is that? And some people have suggested, and this seems to me very plausible, that if you're given to a pantheistic view of God, where God and the world are really the same, or that uh, in some sense the world emanates out of God, or the world is an aspect of God, that naturally suggest feminine imagery, like, the, like God giving birth to the world, right? There's a continuity between the world and God that you find in pantheism that lends itself to mat a maternal way of conceiving of God. Whereas in the, the Western uh, tradition and in monotheistic relig religions like Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, but also in the philosophical theist tradition represented by writers like Aristotle and Aquinas and so forth, uh, you find a, an absolute distinction between God and the world. Because God is pure actuality, say, unchanging, but the world is a mixture of potential and actual and constantly changing. There's this radical divide. God creates the world out of nothing and so forth. You have this radical divide that isn't consistent with this maternal imagery of God giving birth to the world and so forth. And so to sort of protect that absolute distinction between God and, and creation, that you find in the, the Western classical theistic tradition, that's one reason why masculine imagery is taken to be more appropriate. In himself, God, since God is not material, he doesn't have sex organs, he doesn't, he's neither male nor female in any literal way. So that's generally understood. But the idea is since, since he's also not impersonal in the sense of being subpersonal, less personal than we are, but rather something infinitely more than that, um, using it to refer to God would be inappropriate too. So it's gotta be some personal pronoun, say, Got to be some personal way of talking about God. And the idea was that the distinction between pantheism, God and the world are the same or continuous on the one hand, and classical theism on the other, the idea is that the masculine imagery is a better set of images to use. That's the philosophical reason. And then the theological uh, reason would be that you have certainly in uh, Christianity and Catholicism in particular, a whole theology of the relationship of the individual religious believer to God and to the church and so forth that is deeply tied to uh, certain masculine and feminine roles as traditionally understood. So uh, the church is called Holy Mother Church. The believer is the child who is being, you might say, almost gestating within the womb of the church, being prepared for the resurrection, for the afterlife. And God is like, you know, is the more distant father figure, as it were. And part of this is cultural, but I think it's more than that as well. I think there are deep theological reasons why you find the, the masculine imagery used for God, the more feminine imagery used for the church, um, 
it's, you know, a lot of people like to say, well, this is all just sexism and it's all reflects some medieval Neanderthal or whatever, right? It's, there, are, there are real serious, there are real reasons, there are serious philosophical and theological reasons for this, this sort of imagery, though, I think. But that, that, that is a side question from the question of proving God's existence. All right, yes? How do you avoid getting into an ultimate abstraction when you talk about God as the ultimate cause, the unmoved mover? I mean, you really seem to lose the personal aspect. Our Christian teaching is God is a loving, what do you want to say, father and kind. Mm -hmm. And someone that you have a personal relationship. How can you have a personal relationship with the ultimate abstractions, which seems to be what you're describing? Well, that's a good question. I, 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 there are a number of things to be said about that. Um, for one thing, as I, as I just indicated, when you when you unpack the, the arguments for the divine attributes, uh, you certainly get a, uh, you, you get a conception of God as uh, that in, you know, it, it, God has something analogous to what we call intellect and will in us. So he is not less than we are as far as personal attributes are concerned, if you want to call them personal attributes. So we can say in that sense that God is personal rather than impersonal, not an impersonal it. He's not a platonic form or anything like that. So that's part of the, and, and that could be developed. That's part, of the, that's part of the response. But beyond that, I would also say, just from purely philosophical considerations, without having to appeal to divine revelation, there are clear indications that God does take a special interest in human beings that he doesn't take in, in other things. And this has to do with human nature itself. When you unpack the philosophical analysis of human nature, certainly in uh, the Thomistic tradition, in Aquinas, uh, we find that on, on purely philosophical grounds, no appeal to divine revelation is necessary, we can see that, um, that human beings have immortal souls. That there's an aspect of human nature, namely our intellectual activity, which cannot be uh, understood as a bodily activity. It's immaterial. And when you un un unpack this whole uh, Thomistic argument, and I say a bit about this in The Last Superstition, and I say a lot more about it in my book on Aquinas, the idea is that you can show through purely phil philosophical arguments that, that human beings have immortal souls in a way that animals do not have. Okay? And we also, uh, we also find through, again, purely philosophical arguments, not appeal to divine revelation, that precisely because the human soul is something that has this immaterial power, namely intellectual activity, it's not something that could be generated by purely material processes. It has to be specially infused by the first cause, by the cause of the world, when any new human being comes into being. Okay, now what does this tell us? This tells us on purely philosophical grounds, and all I've done is note that these arguments are there. I haven't tried to give the arguments now. They're, they're in the books if, you're, if anybody's interested. But what we see here is on purely philosophical grounds, even before we've gotten to divine revelation, that the uncaused cause of the world, this purely actual cause of the world, specially creates, in the case of every individual human being, a, an immortal soul that carries on you know, forever beyond the death of the body, beyond the death of this you know, 70, 80 year existence. Now, it would be very odd that the cause of the world should do that if, if there were not some reason for it. Nature does nothing in vain. The old Aristotelian saying has it, and God certainly does nothing in vain. And so the idea is that from that alone we can see that there is some concern that God takes in human beings that he doesn't take in other things. There's, there's a special significance or importance to human beings that even other uh, natural phenomena do not have insofar as we have by our nature uh, this immortal aspect. Now, to understanding, well, what exactly is it that God is doing with us? What, what, is, what is he made us for in detail and so forth? That would require divine revelation. So, um, you know, Aquinas would be the first to say that w the, the, the deepest truths about God's relationship to the world and God's love for us and so forth, that's something we can never fully understand apart from divine revelation. We need more than just what philosophy can tell us. But I would say at the same time, it's not that philosophy tells us nothing about God as someone who takes a special concern for us. The, the considerations I've just given, I think, indicate that, that uh, philosophy alone can tell us that there is something going on there, that there's some reason for which God has made us that is the unique in creation. Does that speak to your... I understand what you're saying. Okay. Yes? I'm not sure it addresses this question, though. If God is pure act, in what way could God be concerned or be affected? If God is absolutely unmoved, he's unmoved by anything that we might do, 
in what sense does that make sense to have a loving being to whom I should direct petitionary prayer, who's uh, becoming flesh, who's... Uh, so all of these uh, very uh, temporal, moving, affected things which seem to be incompatible with pure act, completely unmoved. Move. I take that to be his question, not that why we might be special, but how could that I be, see. be moved? How could he be, okay. So well, be yeah, well, um, he can't be moved in the sense of uh, being made to go from potential to actual uh, for the reasons given. So if the question is how can he be moved in that sense, Aquinas would just say, well, he can't be. I mean, that's my, that's my whole point, he would say. But of course, that just raises the question, well, what does it mean then to say God is love and so forth, and God loves us and that's takes right. a sort of concern? And that's what the, okay. Um, well, what, what uh, Aquinas, and not only Aquinas, but the, the classical tradition in general would say is that while it's true that in us human beings, love involves, at least in the usual case, an, uh, an affective component. Love involves passion, right? We undergo, we're subjected to the one we, you're in love with someone, you're moved by them, you're changed by them, and so forth. That's not what's essential to love. Certainly not uh, the sort of love that God has and that we also have. Uh, love, in the deepest sense, is an act of will. It's not a passion. It doesn't necessarily involve an emotional component or anything else that would imply being changed, going from potential to actual. Love is an act of will. For Aquinas, to love is to will the good of another. It's something that reflects will rather than emotion, say. And if there is in God something analogous to will, and you might say that that, that, it's, that, that would follow just from the idea of God as cause of the world itself, um, then uh, we can make sense of the idea of God loving the world and loving us as part of the world insofar as love is an act of will, involves willing the good for us. So it's in that sense in which God loves us. It's not that God feels, you know, uh, in the way we feel when, we're, when we are in love with someone or when we love our children or our parents or what have you. There is something analogous to that insofar as we can, we can think of God as a heavenly father and so forth. But when we unpack philosophically what that means, it doesn't, it, it's not that God is sitting up in heaven, as it were, feeling emotions. For, oh, I hope he doesn't, you know, he skinned his knee, I feel bad. It's not that kind of... Aristotelian view. Uh, Aristotle picked a very different model of love, didn't he, for his unmoved movement. Eros was used in order to depict a form of love which could move without being moved. Yeah, well... Uh, and, I mean, I don't know if that's, if you think that's incompatible or different than uh, what, what uh, Thomas does with it. Well, I think that uh, Aquinas, he certainly goes beyond what Aristotle says, because of course, uh, Aristotle's understanding of God, God only really ever contemplates himself anyway, because um, there's nothing else worth contemplating. Um, the way God, the way Aquinas... That could be affected, right? He, he would be moved, and so he couldn't, couldn't be affected. So the model of love that he had to choose was... It was naturally Eros. Yeah. Well, but but he, but the, the, now the way Aquinas would understand, the, you know, the way he would reconcile, you might say, Aristotle's conception of the unmoved mover only ever contemplating or loving himself, right? Only very, very really knowing himself and not the world. He would say that God knows the world precisely in the act of causing it. He knows what's going on in this room right now precisely in, in the same way that you know your own thoughts right now. If you if you decide, okay, I'm right now going to think about. Uh, an elephant. I know you are, because I, I just said elephant. Uh, there's a, or, but, but suppose it was an act of your will. Right? You decide, I'm going to think about an elephant right now. Right? How do you know that's what you're thinking about? Well, it's because you, you made yourself think about it. Right? In the act of causing that thought, you know the thought. Now, the world is not God's thought, but nevertheless, the, the, the point of the analogy is this, that God knows the world precisely in the act of, of knowing himself as cause of the world. So, I mean, this is the way, this is a bit of a side point, but this is the way Aquinas would reconcile his view of God's knowledge of the world with this Aristotelian idea that God knows himself, because only, he's the only thing worth knowing about and so forth. As far as love is concerned, though, yeah, I mean, Aquinas is going beyond what Aristotle uh, would say, and he's thinking of love as uh, not essentially involving Eros, say, but as involving, again, the, it's, it's the idea of willing the good of the object of love. In this case, the good of the creature, the good of human beings and other, uh, the other things that make up the natural order. So it doesn't involve an emotional component. It d doesn't involve any sort of passion in that sense of undergoing change. Yes? Uh, you just mentioned the passing <coughs> once. Uh, 
when you were talking about the impossibility of a series of past events uh, that Thomas's uh, treatment of that whole matter that you you didn't really agree with Thomas on that point or yeah. something like that, and and I'm just uh, he didn't say anything about it. it was just <coughs> does that mean that? Uh, do you in fact accept so some version of the Claw Yeah, I, yeah, I, 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 um, I don't have a settled view on it other than that I think it's probably correct. I think the the the, the question is answering about the Kalam cosmological argument, which is a traditional first cause argument that does proceed from this idea that the world must have had a beginning and that God is the beginning of the world. I think that sort of argument probably does work actually, but I don't I don't think it's the most fundamental sort of argument for God's existence. And so it's one that I haven't myself defended in uh, either The Last Superstition or in my, in my book on Aquinas. And Aquinas himself doesn't accept it, which is naturally why I don't talk about it in the book on Aquinas. But, but I do think it probably works. Um, but I, I myself, I'm more interested in the, in the arguments that, that don't rest on that idea that the world had a beginning. Yes? Um. This is just out of curiosity, but the, de the divine command theory uh, for morals being brought out by God, how, how are we so supposed to say that in our culture that our morals are right over in other cultures? Like, like uh, you know, human sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Well, um, <clears throat> I guess the, the short answer to that is that at least as the idea of divine command theory is typically understood, Aquinas is not a divine command theorist. Um, and the, the reason is this, that morality for Aquinas is ultimately determined by the good for human beings, what's good for us by our nature. And to use an example I think I used last night, if we think of you know, a simple example like a triangle, right? Um, there's an objective fact about what it is to be a good triangle. I don't mean good in a moral sense, right? We wouldn't say naughty triangle, good triangle, right? <laughs> but if you draw a triangle, a Euclidean triangle, where you, know, you draw it uh, uh, very loosely as you're, move, you know, as, as you're sitting in the car or something doing your, your geometry homework or what have you, right? It's not going to be as good a triangle. It's not going to be as good an instance or example of a triangle as one that you sit down and draw carefully with a, a straight edge. And the reason is that it, it, it conforms less well, you might say, to the nature or essence of triangularity considered in the abstract that the, the triangle drawn with a ruler does. So there's a fact of the matter, an objective fact of the matter, it doesn't have to do with our tastes or interests or what have you, about what makes something a better or worse triangle. It has to do with the nature of the thing. Goodness for the sort of tradition that uh, Aquinas represents and Aristotle and Plato represent has to do with uh, how well or badly something conforms to its nature. Now when you get to living things which uh, go through a life cycle, right, you have creatures who um, realize they're good only through a, the course of time. It's not all at once. I mean, a triangle is a sort of abstraction, but if you consider just a, 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 a dr triangle drawn on paper, right, it's a kind of all at once reality. The triangle doesn't, isn't born, doesn't die. It's not that kind of thing. But if you think of a, an animal, a snake, or a dog, or a cat, or a squirrel, or something, you've got something that undergoes a life cycle, and so it, it only realizes its nature through time, you might say. And there are certain characteristic behaviors, say, that uh, a good squirrel, as it were, by which, again, I don't mean the moral sense. You know, we don't discipline squirrels the way we discipline children because there's no moral responsibility there. Nevertheless, if a, to use an example I use in one of the books, maybe both of them, if <clears throat> you allow a squirrel, say, to scamper up trees and gather nuts for acorns for the winter, whatever, it's going to realize its squirrel nature, its squirrel essence, whatever, right? More fully than the squirrel that you, you keep trapped in a cage and you feed it nothing but uh, toothpaste on Ritz crackers or something, right? That squirrel is going to become sickly, right? Even if it gets addicted to the crackers and you open the key, I feel guilty, come on out squirrel, Flour you know, flourish, frolic, right? It doesn't want to, it sits there, you know, just wants to sit there skinny with its Ritz, Ritz crackers watching the TV you put in front of it or whatever, right? <laughs> now, that squirrel isn't realizing its nature as fully as uh, the squirrel that scampers about and collects nuts is. Now, when we turn to human beings, we've got 
creatures that are like that, we go through life cycles, there are different aspects of our nature that we have to realize if we're to flourish as human beings. But we also have free choice, which is, which is what makes uh, our realization of, of goodness or failure to realize it, our, our fulfilling our nature or not fulfilling it, a moral matter. In a way, it's not in the case of the triangle or, or the squirrel. And that, too, is ultimately defined by our nature, just like there's an objective fact of the matter about what a triangle is, an objective fact of the matter about what's involved in being a squirrel. There's also an objective fact of the matter about human nature. There's certain things that fulfill our nature and certain things that frustrate our nature. And the, the devil's in the details. I mean, to, to, to settle any particular moral dispute, whether it's human sacrifice or questions about sexual morality or whatever, uh, we need to get into the details of human nature. But nevertheless, the point is this, that notice in nothing, I, nothing what I've said here is at all appealed to divine commands. I've never said, well, such and such is wrong because God said it's wrong, and so forth. The appeal is always ultimately to human nature. Now, at the end of the day, human nature itself, like everything else in the world, ultimately uh, exists only because God causes us to exist with the natures we have, and so forth. And there are also certain aspects of morality that, that necessarily reflect our relationship to God, because part of our nature... Uh, ultimately, when you unpack it all, Aquinas would argue, and Aristotle says the same thing, is to know God, to have a kind of uh, relationship uh, to God. So I'm, I'm certainly not saying that there is no religious component to morality. And I would even say, and I, I spell this out in detail in my book on Aquinas in the last, uh, last chapter of that book, that a full account of, real, uh, of morality does involve an element of what you might call divine command theory. But it's not, it's, it has nothing to do with the idea that, well, something's good ultimately just because God arbitrarily says it's good, right? It's not that kind of divine command theory in the way people often understand that. And so at least a, to, a, to a very large extent, uh, moral questions can be dealt with and disputes between different individuals and different cultures on moral questions. Uh, including the question of human sacrifice, I would say, they can be resolved without appeal to divine command, but, but rather by appealing to natural law and to human nature as the, the ground of natural law. That's, I'm about to say that's the short answer, except I know it wasn't very brief, but... <laughs> yes? All right, so um, given the idea that nothing can exist without it existing somehow either, you know, in actuality or in potentially in cause, um, the specific example. Um, right. How do we reconcile the existence of evil with the idea of an all-good God? Well, that, that's another big, big question. Solve the problem of evil in 30 seconds, phase. Um, <laughs> I know, which I know is not what you're saying. Um, well, I mean, there, there are a number of things to be said about that as well. And, and uh, part of the answer has to do with something I mentioned earlier, that um, we c if, if Aquinas is right, and again, not just Aquinas, but the tradition he represents is right, then we can know f through, through purely philosophical arguments that human beings have immortal souls. And one thing that tells us is that in the case of a human being, unlike, unlike the squirrel, say, or a dog or a cat, our deaths are not the end of the story. There's something in our nature that points to, to a, 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 an everlasting existence beyond, beyond this one. And so one point that's crucial to keep in mind in the case of the problem of evil is that um, if, as uh, Aquinas would argue, God is cap being all-powerful, is capable of drawing good out of evil, even the worst evils, and we know through purely philosophical arguments that death is not the end for us anyway, in order to know that the existence of evil is somehow incompatible with God's goodness, we'd have to know that God cannot draw good even out of the worst evils we suffer. That's something that would only really be plausible if death was the end for us. You might say, well, death's the end. There's nothing that could happen now that could make up for or no good that could be drawn out of the evil that so-and-so suffered during this life. But if death is not the end, for any particular individual or for the human race in general, then that already blocks the idea that somehow there is, you know, once, once we die, that's the end of the story and there can be no good drawn out of the evils we've suffered. It's only the beginning of the story. It's really only a blip in the history of any particular soul. But that's part of the story. Um, I, I, I would also say when you unpack the, the Aristotelian Thomistic conception of God as pure actuality and being itself and so on and so forth, and the theory of, of, of good, the theory of goodness, 
that comes out of this whole metaphysical system, it turns out that a purely actual being would of necessity be pure goodness. In fact, wouldn't be, would, it wouldn't merely be that God is perfectly good. God is perfect goodness itself. Um, again, I get into all this in the, in the books. But the, the point is that, uh, uh, as far as the problem of evil is concerned, that when you unpack the concept of what a cause the world would have to be, we can see that it really makes no sense to, to think of God as anything less than perfectly good. And so the idea is this, that the arguments for God's existence by themselves already get you to uh, the existence of a being who is perfect goodness, that we can't even make sense of as having any sort of defect or in any way being evil. And the, the idea that there's even a, you know, a, uh, on the surface, a conflict between the evil that exists in the world and the existence of a good God itself is undermined. We consider that God as being all powerful can draw good out of even the worst evils we suffer, uh, especially we keep in mind that this life is only the beginning of the existence of our immortal souls and by no means the end of it. Uh, we simply have no, re we, have, we have every reason to say God is perfectly good and no reason to think that he can't uh, draw good out of even the worst evils we suffer. So the, the problem of evil, I would say, really dissolves as an intellectual problem uh, when we understand, uh, we bring all these different philosophical considerations together. Now I emphasize as an, as an intellectual problem, I think it ultimately is, is undermined. As, as an argument that somehow there is no good God, I don't think the problem of evil really has any force. But as a practical problem, it remains because you know, I would say reason tells us that there is, a, there is a God who is all good, all powerful, who is concerned about our well-being, who's perfectly capable of drawing uh, a good out of any evil uh, that we suffer that is so grand that in hindsight we'll all say it was worth it, as it were, right? But this is something we know through cold, hard, abstract philosophical argument. And when your child dies, right, or you've got cancer, all that suddenly becomes cold and un, it can be, you know, uh, it can be unsatisfying. But that's a problem, that's a practical problem. It's not, it's not an intellectual problem about whether there is a God. It's rather a practical problem of, about how to live our lives and to trust God in the face of the evils we suffer because we're not, we're not disembodied intellects. We're not angels who, uh, you know, we're bodily creatures. We're limited to here and now in time and space. And so it can be very painful uh, to, to be a human being. But I would say that's, a, that's really a practical problem about how to, to live the religious life rather than an intellectual problem about whether God really exists in the first place and so forth. And so I, I don't mean to minimize the practical problem at all. Okay. Again, that's the, the short, <laughs> short answer. But. There's one last question. Uh, yes. So I guess to bring up another uh, issue that's been on the philosophical playing field for a long time, that would be of free will. And so you mentioned that it was brought up about a morality, and morality requires responsibility for it to hold up. Responsibility would require some making a free choice. Yeah. But that free choice would have to come from, you know, the cause of you choosing to do it that creates the effect of what you choose to do. And you pull that cause all the way back through the argument that you made where um, it is, what is that, an essential ordering <coughs> that, that would pull all the way through back to the initial being that that led through to your, to your, what you think of it as a decision. Yeah. But is it compatible to have, to have free will if it holds that we're just making that choice as, you know, one, one thing, pulling all the way back up to that being that started? To the, to the uncaused cause. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Phaser, solve the problem of free will in 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> No, it's a perfectly fair question. I, I'm trying to think of how to boil down the answer into a, a, you know, a minute or so. And I guess the way I would do it, with it is this way. That uh, what Aquinas says is this, that we need to make a distinction between causes that are operative in the world. Let the circle represent the universe, right? And God as cause of the world, right? Now, think of, uh, again, think of the squirrel example, the squirrel in the cage. So we say, you got this, this weird squirrel, this guy's kept in a cage for a year and it wants to eat nothing but toothpaste and Ritz crackers, right? So much so that when you let the squirrel, come on squirrel, come on, it doesn't want to do it. It's been, it's, it's addicted to the, give me my, my Ritz cracker fix, right? I need my crest fix for the day, right? Okay, now we want to say that the, the squirrel is acting in a sense unnaturally. It's acting contrary to what its nature would otherwise have been. Why? Because something else has interfered with it this weird guy with the toothpaste and the crackers in the cage, right? Okay. Now, what's going on in that case is you've got a certain 
a certain natural object, a certain uh, a created thing, the squirrel, being interfered with, its natural operations are being interfered with by some other uh, cre creature, some other uh, natural object, namely the guy who's kidnapped it and so forth, right, or captured the, captured the squirrel. Um, and it's in that sense that uh, the squirrel A is, is acting contrary to its, to its nature. Okay, I haven't said anything about free will yet, but the idea is this, that what makes it the case that this thing is acting contrary to its nature has to do with something else in the created or that's interfering with it, right? It has to do with other things going on in the circle. In, uh, in the universe, right? Now, <clears throat> what Aquinas wants to say is this. God, is not, God has caused the world. He is not one cause among others within the world. He is outside the world altogether, keeping the whole thing going, right? Now, when we think of natural processes, forget about the squirrel, say, think instead of, a, of an earthquake, right? We say, why did the boulder roll down the hill? Because there was this earthquake that knocked it off its perch and it started rolling, right? That just happened naturally, okay? When we think of God as the ultimate cause of the world, right, that means he's the cause of the earthquake, the boulder, and everything else. But of course, that doesn't mean that somehow the boulder's uh, action in rolling down the hill was unnatural in the way that the squirrel's action is unnatural or contrary to its nature. Um, it's perfectly natural for the boulder to roll down the hill, right, even though God is ultimately the cause of its motion down the hill and the cause of everything else. Okay, so far so good? God, it's not as if God was some other object in the world that was interfering with what the boulder would have done. That's not the kind of God, that's not the kind of cause God is. He's outside the world altogether, keeping all things operating at every moment according to their natures. Okay, the fact that God causes the world and causes things to happen in the world the way they do doesn't make them somehow unnatural. Okay, now turn to finally to free will. And the idea here is this, that if you consider a a uh, person who carries out free choices and so forth. Um, what it, for Aquinas, what it, what, when we say that, that someone's act was less than free, what that means is that something else in the created order interfered with it, right? So suppose I was uh, freely, you know, I was about to stab somebody, right? And a policeman came and he stopped me. I don't want to kill that guy, right? He stopped me from doing it. If someone came up to me later and said, hey, you didn't, you didn't kill that guy, good choice, right? I could say, look, I didn't kill him, not because I didn't want to. I wanted, I was going to do it, but I was prevented from doing it, right? My free will was prevented from operating, right? Because something else in the created order prevented me from carrying out the free act that I had chosen to do, right? Just like the squirrel is acting to go back to something acting according to its nature or contrary to its nature, it, wasn't, it, it was made to act unnaturally by some guy who kidnapped it and distorted its natural drives and so forth. Okay. But the point is this, that um, just as what makes uh, a thing's behavior natural or unnatural has to do with other things going on in the created order, it doesn't have to do with what God's doing outside the created order, something's being either a free act or an unfree act has to do with what other things within the circle, within the created order are doing to it preventing it from, you know, uh, from operating according to, to, to its free choices, cr uh, preventing this guy from, from acting in accordance with his free choices. Whether his action are free or is free or not has to do with what else is going on here. Has someone stopped his hand before he could stab the guy? Has someone put drugs in his coffee so that his thought processes are messed up and he's doing crazy things? Is there a mad scientist to put an electrode in his brain who's controlling him, right? It's that kind of thing that would make what he's doing less than free. But God is not an actor among other actors within the circle, within the world. He's outside the world altogether. What Aquinas would say to sort of finally get to the, the, the payoff here is this, that just as God's being the cause of the boulder's action doesn't make the boulder's behavior unnatural, God's being the ultimate cause of us and everything about us, including our choices, doesn't make them anything less, any less free. Because God is not one agent among others within the world. That's the sort of thing that can interfere with our freedom. God's a, a far, he's far, it's a far deeper reality than that, far more fundamental. He's outside the world altogether. Keeping natural objects in existence, and that doesn't make what they do any less natural, and keeping free rational beings in existence too, but that doesn't make their actions any less free or rational. Okay, that's another way to think about this real quick is that you could think of God's relationship to the world 
as the relationship between an author and the story he writes. There's a sense in which you might say, you know, if you're reading some novel about a murderer or something, right? You're not going to say, if somebody says, man, that, did you read that, uh, you, you know, did you, see, uh, that, did you see Silence of the Lambs, right? It switched to a movie example instead of a novel example, right? Boy, that Hannibal Lecter's a nasty guy, right? What an evil guy. No one would say, well, he's not really evil. I mean, because after all, the, the screenwriter made him that way, so he's not really evil, right? Uh, if you say, no, but no, he freely decided to torment Jodie Foster with these nasty things he said to her, right? Or to eat the guy's liver with the fava beans or whatever it was, right? Um, he freely chose to do that. Well, he didn't really because the, the author, the screenwriter, made him do it, right? Well, the relationship of the screenwriter to the character is not like the relationship of the characters to one, to one another. It's not the same kind of relationship. And for that reason, it makes perfect sense to say that Hannibal Lecter freely chose to become a cannibal, say, right? Um, even though ultimately it's the screenwriter who wrote the story in which he does that. Um, because it's only other things going on within the story, as it were. Let's say you know, somebody kidnaps Lecter, puts an electrode in his brain and controls him so that he goes and eats human flesh and so forth. That's the sort of thing that would lead us to say he wasn't acting freely, right? But if in the story itself, Lecter says, you know what, I love being a cannibal. I've always wanted to be one since the time I was young, right? So I took this home study course and whatever, right? <laughs> we say, ah, he freely, he's responsible for his actions. And the fact that the screenwriter ultimately made up the whole story doesn't change that. You could think of God's relationship to the world as analogous to that. God is like the screenwriter or the author who has written the story of the universe, but it doesn't make our actions within the universe any less free because he's not like some other element of the story or some other character in the story who could either interfere with or refrain from interfering with our free choices. He's beyond all that. He's the author of the whole story. Uh, he's not one thing among others. As I put it er earlier, he's not a being among other beings. He's pure being itself. He's far beyond anything that we're familiar with in ordinary, everyday experience. Okay, so that's, the, that's definitely not the short answer, but it's, it's a shorter answer than, than a full treatment would require, obviously. Well, please join me in thanking Dr. Thank you.